what I tell you basically about this book is, is it's, a, it's a great story, and it's not because I wrote it, because I'm a not so great writer, but uh, this man's life was, was incredible, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience with him, and then quite frankly, as much time as I spent with him, I didn't know him at all. So I was, a, uh, I was in the Marine Corps for 26 years. I was a very junior major. I was a headquarters Marine Corps, and they have different departments, and they have a three-star in charge. And for the manpower department, the uh, three-star came in, Lieutenant General Christmas, and every branch had to nominate somebody. And my boss called me and said, hey, you're nominated to be General Christmas's aide. And I said, I, I absolutely do not want to do that. We used to call them dopes on a rope because they wore this thing on their arm. <laughs> but I, I had no interest in being his aide. And uh, my boss got very angry at me and asked me, do you have any idea who General Christmas is? And I said, well, you know, I know he's a general in the Marine Corps. He's got a big scar on his face, and he did something in Vietnam. But other than that, I really don't know. And uh, how, how short-sighted that was. So I still get sent up. And I think that's probably not because I was the best qualified, I was probably the, the guy that they lost that was the least impact, if you want to know the truth. But I go in and uh, I'm sitting there and there's a guy also interviewing for the job and he wanted the job in the worst way. And I'm thinking, this is great, this guy's going to get it. And uh, I go in and I remember General Chris Berry played basketball at the University of Pennsylvania, he's much taller than I. And uh, first question was, do you want this job? And I was absolutely honest with him. I said, I, I absolutely do not want this job. It, it, like any job in the Marine Corps, if you get it, I'm going to do my best. But uh, I, I do not want to be your aide. So I walked out of there uh, feeling good about myself. And three days later, I got notified. I needed to report immediately. And I was taking the gentleman's wife to Mexico City to represent the Secretary of the Navy at a presidential event. So, so I went from zero. I didn't want the job to go in full blast. Uh, the interesting thing, and what I tried to do with the book too, is, is I start with when his grandfather Mortimer came to the United States. Nobody really knows where he came from. But just to give you a type of character Mortimer was, they're up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, it's the 20s, they're scraping by, and his wife died, and they had six kids. And this is sort of three strong themes in General Christmas's life, and this is sort of the basis behind one of them. Uh, his wife died. And he married a young, new, attractive lady, and she did not like kids. So he lined them up. You two, you're 16 or older, you're on your own. The rest of you, he took them down to an orphanage and dropped them off. He got rid of his own kids. The two older ones went to Philadelphia, started getting by, and it was very traumatic to the kids to get separated. And as they could afford it, they go to the orphanage and they take one out. And they kept going back until they had all of their, their siblings back together. And, and one of the things that Marine Corps side that General Christmas, you, there's just a huge strong theme of faith and family throughout his life. It continues today. And he said, he grew up in Philadelphia, and he said as a youngster there, he said our house was always full of somebody. They, they always took people in. You always took care of your family. He said there was uh, an old lady, uh, her name was Wheezy. And she, uh, she came to live with him for two years under the guise of giving piano lessons. And he said, we didn't have a piano. So the parents were just taking these people in and taking them in. Uh, he grew up uh, very much on the margin of poverty. He, he, he remembers greatly his father selling uh, uh, war bonds during the war in Philadelphia. His father had tried to enlist in the Navy, sold the car, went off, and they sent him back because he was too old. So he became the, the local air warden because Philadelphia, you know, a lot of ships coming in, there's always rumors. So he was the guy who had the crank and the, the doughboy hat to tell everybody to take off running and stuff and happen. But uh, he uh, was the first person in his family to graduate from high school. Uh, he, he was very involved in athletics. He uh, expected to go to Penn State. And the University of Pennsylvania, you all probably know, is an Ivy League school located in Philadelphia. And even then, it was for the rich, the very smart. It was, it was pretty exclusive. But at the time, the university was trying to become more diversified. And they had a program that if you would agree to teach school in the, in the state of Pennsylvania for five years, you got free tuition and guaranteed admission to the University of Pennsylvania, which is a huge deal. So he jumped on that. 
And uh, after one semester, he realized he did not want to be a school teacher. He became a history major. So he was a janitor at Edison Power to pay his way through college with loans and everything. He joined Naval ROTC. He said he had no interest really in the military, but the draft was going on. And he knew sooner or later he was going to be in the service, so he chose it on his own terms. He had no connection to the Marine Corps at all. Uh, but the Naval ROTC unit, which has Marines and, and, and sailors involved in it, he said that the only thing that drew him to the Marine Corps was the example of the Marines he saw in the NRTC unit. He liked how they looked, he liked their uniforms, and all that. But he was having a good time in college. He was on the cusp of uh, getting uh, kicked out of college. He uh, had played basketball for the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he was a walk-on, and they made fun of him because he still did his foul shots underhanded. But he said on, uh, on traveling, when they had an away game, they couldn't take everybody. So the second string would have a uh, foul shooting contest, and whoever won got to go. And he said it was a, a good trip, good food, and he most frequently won. And he also played a thing called sprint football at Navy, which is uh, you can only weigh 165 pounds. But uh, his grades were so bad, you are going to uh, you you can't play sports. And the NRTC guys came in and told him, hey, you, if you stay down this path, you are not going to get a commission in the Marine Corps. Which, after visiting Quantico for a summer, he knew that's what he really wanted. So he got out of the frat house. And, and this is, I won't spoil it all for you, but he, he, he moved in with two grad students there. And it's, it's interesting how these remarkable characters in his life at certain times appeared. These were two PhD candidates, and I won't spoil your name for them, but one of them became the professor of the Wharton School of Business years later. One guy was a magnet in the plastic industry, and he said it was their example of how to study that, that uh, made him uh, knuckle down. It's interesting. Uh, he, I had his whole record from the Marine Corps, which was every performance evaluation from second lieutenant to lieutenant general. I had his college transcripts. And uh, I wrote in there, it's in the book, he had a semester where he had two Fs. And he actually called me out on that. He goes, he, he'd review it. He said, you know, John, I don't think my grades were that bad. And I said, well, you know, sir, I've got your transcript here, and I know exactly how bad they were. But it's interesting, his daughter, who went to Gettysburg College, we were talking and she said she wished so much she had known her dad's grades were that bad because he wrote her hard the whole time through college. She could have used that against him. But he took a commission in the Marine Corps with uh, no intention of staying in. Uh, he went down and he served in an infantry battalion. And again, industry, interesting characters along the way. His bunkmate in, on, this, on his deployment to the Mediterranean was Marshall Carter, Carter Marshall, excuse me, Marshall Carter, who became the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange later. His roommate at TBS was Barney Barnum, who won the Medal of Honor. Mm -hmm. And in his squad alone, uh, which is just 12 guys while he's going through school, they produced three three-star generals and a Medal of Honor winner. Now, it was a standing joke. They had a lot of uh, foreign students participating in this training. And, and, and uh, General Christmas at the time, Lieutenant Christmas, was assigned to a Vietnamese officer. And American involvement in Vietnam was pretty minimal then. And, and he got to know this guy well. This guy professed how bad he hated communism and he was going to go back and win. And Christmas would take him to Philadelphia, even went and saw him off. And years later, this same Vietnamese officer became the only South Vietnamese Marine to defect to the North. So he took a lot of grief for that from his buddies, even. Heck, when I was the aide, you know, years later, he'd be having a beer with his friends, and they had, but I remember you, so yeah, you did your part. But uh, he left there, and he went to 8th and I, and I don't know if you're all familiar with Marine Barracks in Washington. That's where you see they twirl the rifles on Friday night, oh, yeah. and the big parade and everything. Well, he was assigned there, and, uh, and everybody started getting concerned because the Vietnam War was starting, and it was starting to ramp up. And uh, he uh, fought hard to leave early. Now, the interesting thing to tell you is a little bit about Mrs. Christmas. Mrs. Christmas was, as he'll tell you, in the Marine Corps longer than his, she, he was. Her father is a guy named Colonel David Lowndes, and he was a three-war Marine. Wounded on Iwo Jima, fought in Korea, and then I'm sure you're all familiar with the Siege of Quezon. I don't know if you're familiar up in the mountains, there was a Marine regiment surrounded by multiple North Vietnamese. So everybody was going to be din bin food. They are going to get ran over. He was a senior Marine there. So 
he's quite a character. Big old handlebar mustache. Uh, you know, you'll read the book, but it's a couple of vignettes. He had this handlebar mustache, and, and the Siege of Kaesong was such a significant event, even Lyndon Johnson was getting a daily brief because they thought this whole unit was going to get annihilated like the French did, and they held out. But uh, they flew him back home uh, weeks after the siege lifted to get a presidential unit citation. There's a picture in the book. It's a big deal that a unit gets awarded for this. And uh, he, he was directed to cut his handlebar mustache off, which was non-regulation by the highest authority, his wife. <laughs> so you think it's all over. No. His wife was a charcoal artist, and she drew a picture of him in case on in his combat gear, and she glued those two tips on, on his <laughs> face and framed it. And uh, Mrs. Christmas, who has uh, eight brothers and sisters, said, they were, there was still a fight going on who, who was going to get that picture of Dad when, uh, and when he passed away. But it was ironic, uh, the general and, and the colonel went to Vietnam at the same time. And when, while the colonel was, was surrounded at Quezon, this is a Tet Offensive, General Christmas was fighting through the ways, streets of Way City, which probably until Fallujah most recently was a significant urban battle for the Marine Corps. In fact, if you go to the Marine War Memorial in Arlington Cemetery, Way City is, is one of the names on there. But he led a rifle company there, and his uh, battalion commander was a big guy named Ernie Cheatham, and he retired as a three-star general too. And Big Ernie played pro football, he was a big man. And uh, a couple things to tell you how, how Cheatham ran things. He, he, he was a very stabilizing, aggressive uh, uh, leader. But he understood his young guys would get frustrated at times. And uh, Christmas uh, said, right before the Tet Offensive started, they'd been chasing ghosts. In the, you know, they, they, had, they were getting, taking casualties, but never really getting to see who was. And he said, in this one uh, instant out on the Liberty Road, they finally attracted a group of Vietnamese between them and the river. And, and they're finally going to go in and, and get their uh, vengeance. And all at once, Cheatham calls him on the radio. Break contact, get back out the road, we got to go. He said he ran 400 yards just to scream at the battalion commander to tell him, what are you doing? We finally got these guys. He goes, get on the truck. And what had happened, the Tet Offensive started. When the Tet Offensive started in, in uh, you know, January, late January 68, Almost every city in Vietnam got attacked. Even the U.S. Embassy was occupied for a while. So, so that was a, a frustrating point. But that, he, he said, Cheatham let him get it out of his system, and they said, shut up and get everybody back relief. But to give an example, they were flew by, and they were sitting down to Way City, and they said, don't take your gear. You'll only be about to, down there about nine hours. You run on down, grab, grab this Arvin General, and come back up to Phu Bai. We ended up... He got wounded and left sooner, but the unit was there for 45 days. It was not a little four-hour trip down and back. The MACV, the Marine uh, the Military Assistance Command, Vietnam headquarters was surrounded. And, and it, it's quite a fight. And, and, I, I, and I tried not to make the book about Way City, but, but you have to tell that story. A couple interesting things from that. Uh, he said the night he got there, uh, there the battalion commander he was with was very panicked and it wasn't Cheatham, but the companies that came, Cheatham was coming. And he said, leaving the compound was suicidal. It was just that bad. And he said that they were, the, this battalion commander was talking about, hey, we're going to do a night attack. And they knew it was suicidal. And he said it was the only time in his Marine Corps career that he and the other two command, company commanders talked and said, you know, if we get this order, we're not going to do it. And that's, that's pretty extraordinary coming from him. Uh, and he, his unit was also the unit, I, I don't know if you remember, there was quite a stir raised. There was an American flag raised in Way City. And U.S. forces were only allowed to raise the South Vietnamese flag. But when they secured the capital, uh, General Christmas said, we're going to put up our flag. And it caused a stir. People from the headquarters came out to say, you got to take it down, and things like that. And uh, he said, I can't assure your safety if you attempt to take it down. He's surrounded by Marines who fought hard and suffered to see that flag go up. And it was a, it was a news event. It's in the, it's, there's some information about it in the book. Fire alarm. Um, oh, no, 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 no worries. Um, 
The General Christmas Act, there's an event in there, and it's certainly covered, and I had eyewitness statements about the day he won the Navy Cross, which is just one step below the Medal of Honor. It's very significant. Uh, they were in a, a stalled attack. He exposed himself. I, I won't go through it all for you. But uh, it's interesting, when I wrote the book, and any time I was ever with him, he always downplayed his role. He would talk about the Marines that he served there with, but he never talked about himself. In fact, we were at an event where they introduced him by reading his Navy Cross citation, and he made it really clear to me that's never to happen again. Uh, but uh, he, he always felt you know, very strongly about his, his, his Marines. He wouldn't play himself up. But that's the one point in the book he called me out. He said, I think you garnished what I did that day. And I said, well, you know, sir, I've got the official write-up, and then I've got five eyewitness statements to what you did that day. And if you read the citation from his Navy Cross, you, you kind of wonder how the guy survived what he did uh, to be alive and well today down in North Carolina. But on February 13th, he got pretty, pretty severely wounded. They were uh, leaving the new part of Way City, and they're going up to the Citadel, and he was in a cemetery. And a guy stood up and shot an RPG at him, and it hit a, a tombstone, and it, and it really damaged his uh, lower left leg severely. And one of the first things that they liberated when they entered Way City, which was kind of a city passed by by the war, was a brothel. And he said they had a big old giant bar in there, so all the Marines filled up their, their packs with booze. And what had happened during one of the heated moments, because this is urban fighting, it's like, I'm going to attack that building over there. And once you start, you can't stop. So when is the right time to attack? And he was really getting pressured by Big Ernie to start this attack. And he said he had a perfect radio man. The radio, he, the radio man said, hey, sir, you know, 2 5 action, big chief of your boss wants you to start the attack now. And Christmas said, in the heat of the moment, he said, tell him to go F himself. And he said, 30 seconds later, he hears the radio operator telling him, telling his boss, Ernie Cheatham, that Captain Christmas just told you to go F yourself. So he kind of knew he was in trouble. Well, the attack went on, and he said every night they didn't fight in Way City. And, and Cheatham would actually get them together, like, what did we learn today? Fight. And he said they happened to be having that gathering in the Way City University, so it was a classroom. And he said, I knew I was in trouble, so he took one of the best models of cognac he had left. And he said he walked in, and he said, I put it on his desk like a kid giving the teacher an apple, and went back in, sat down and looked at my feet, said he never said a word about it. But interestingly enough, days later when Christmas was wounded, and he was being taken out of the city, they stopped, Cheatham came out, he stopped the truck he was in, went and got that bottle of cognac and gave him a drink of it before he left. Now, the interesting thing about the, the medevac and everything was uh, it was a Tet Offensive. There was huge casualties. In fact, in Hotel 25, about 120 guys, General Christmas had 13 killed, and everyone else had been wounded at least once, if not twice. Uh, in fact, the first day of Tet was the, the most costly day in the entire Vietnam War to all the armed forces. And 25, the battalion he was in, <coughs> since World War II had the highest number of casualties that had been experienced. But, uh, you know, huge influx of, of casualties. Well, Marines, we get our medical service through the Navy. So they had the Navy evacuation chain and they had the Army Air Force chain. He said, he remembers, I'm on a helicopter, I'm kind of going in and out because they give me morphine, and I look over and there's a North Vietnamese soldier on the cot right beside me getting treatment. So, he gets there and they're so overwhelmed and he said, it's just mayhem, you know, guys are wounded, you know, triaging. And he goes, all I remember is going to sleep. He wakes up 21 days later. He had a severe infection. He said he woke up in a hospital ward because I was clean, there was nobody there, and a nurse came walking at me. And he goes, I, he goes, I thought I was dead. I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> And uh, the nurse explained to him that shortly after he arrived, this infection had hit him, and he'd basically been in you know, a coma for, or you know, uh, incapacitated for 21 days. So the Air Force Army chain, and you got to understand, there wasn't email and stuff like that. Back when I went to war, my wife lived on Camp Lejeune. She could stay in the house. During Vietnam, your husband's going to Vietnam, you have to move off base. So she moved down to Florida with her mother, 
Colonel Lowndes' wife. So they show up to tell her, hey, he's been wounded, but he's okay, he's back with his unit. She doesn't hear a word from him for four months, all this time thinking he's back. Actually, he's in the hospital chain, getting medevac slowly back to Japan, and he finally calls her four months later. He gets to a phone, and he tells her what happened, and her response is, did you get, did you get hit again? He's like, no, I, this is the first one. That's just to give an example of how things have changed. And, and back then, what they would do if you were in the, uh, if you, if you were wounded, and once you come back, they would send you, if you're going to have extended care, to the VA closest to your home. So he went to the Philadelphia VA Hospital. And he was in there for about 10 months. And it's, it's amazing some of the people that came through there while he was there. But to kind of give you a sense of stuff that just kind of eye-opening, at that point the Vietnam War was 69 going into 70. Uh, the Archbishop of the Episcopal Church for the state of Pennsylvania had declared all Vietnam veterans were war criminals and they could no longer receive communion. And that was, he's a very religious guy, and he had uh, said there was this old priest that would come every day and sneak in communion. So he finally gets out of the hospital and he's all crippled up. And the Marine Corps basically says, you got six months and then you're out here. He didn't want to get out of the Marine Corps, so he fought it. He got down to Quantico, and I don't know if you've all heard of a guy named John Ripley. There's a book about the bridges at Dong Ha. He blew up a bridge by himself, stopped the 1972 Easter Offensive. But uh, Ripley was a monitor. He was the guy that assigned you where you go. And Christmas said, hey man, I, I really want to stay in the Marine Corps. He says, well, here's two things you got to do. You got to pass the Marine Corps physical fitness test. That's three miles plus push sit-ups. And you have to pass a physical. He said, so I'm going to send you to Fort Bragg, an army base, to be an instructor, and I'm going to hide you down there. you got one year. <laughs> well, his healing wasn't going really well. And of course, back then, medical discharge packages would come to Ripley, D.C., and then he would mail it to the unit where the guy was at. So to buy Christmas more time, Ripley would take it. He'd mail it to the recruiting station in Tupelo, Mississippi. So it'd take it a while to get there. What's this? He'd melt back. He'd come to Ripley. He'd melt to Okinawa. And he, gave, he was able to gain an extra year for General Christmas to Hill. Now I tell you, his lower leg is, 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 is pretty tore up. And he knew he had a passive physical. He got to where he could just barely pass a physical fitness test. And of course, at the time, the, the draft was still going on. And he was on the staff. So they had, a host, they had a clinic for permanent personnel. But then you got these massive groups of all these Army draftees on their way to Vietnam. So he said he went over stripped down naked and got in line with the army draftees. He went down the line. It, it, I don't know if you've ever seen the guy with the cigarette that puts the braces on Forrest Gump, you know? He's going to fix you up, boy. And that's how it sounded like the doctor was. He said, I walked down that line. The guy never looked below my waist and stamped me medically fit. And he said, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. So that was his ticket to, to stay in the Marine Corps. Wow. But, I thought that was kind of an interesting, yeah, but it was a struggle for this guy to stay in. A couple things, and then I'll let you go. You probably wonder about the, the name, Needs of the Corps. Well, from the day I went to work for General Christmas, he frequently used that term, particularly when someone was upset, they weren't getting an assignment or whatever. He said, you got to serve the needs of the Corps. And, and the cool thing in the latter part of the book, when he was a senior officer and he was under consideration to actually be the Commandant of the Marine Corps, he illustrated to me uh, very much so about the needs of the Corps. And I'll tell you, I kind of wrap it up with that, and then if you have any questions, I'll let you go. But, so he's a three-star general in Washington, D.C., and there was a discussion about him being the Assistant Commandant or the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And then the largest operational command in the Marine Corps is the Marine Corps uh, Pacific Force, uh, uh, FMF PAC, located in, in Pearl Harbor up in, up in um, Mokalaka Heights. So General Christmas was the director of manpower at the time. And the individual that was nominated, because all the three-star nominations, you know, you're probably hearing the news now, Tommy Tuberville and all that, they have to go through Congress to get voted on. And, and uh, he was nominated to go be the commanding general of all Marine forces in the Pacific. It's two-thirds of the entire Marine Corps, which is a big deal. He had done several previous tours in Vietnam, or excuse me, in Hawaii, so he really, he really uh, liked the place. And 
we were ready to go. His stuff was packed. We were getting ready to get him moved out and all that stuff. And the individual nominated to become his, his replacement could not get confirmed by Congress. If you have a little issue, you're not going to get confirmed. So one day I come into work thinking I'm finally done with this job. And to kind of give you a sense of what a grinder it was, because we were going on weekends too visit every uh, combat command, every NATO country, Marine Corps base every year. And he was a good speaker, so he was always covering events for the Commandant. Uh, I come home, and I was home on a Saturday, and my four-year-old daughter, who's 30 years old now, was telling me she liked when I visited, she wished I'd lived there. So <laughs> that kind of ripped my heart out, but she was dead, she would not believe that I lived there. I only visited. I mean, we get, it, it was so grinding, i tell you a quick story. He lived at 8th and I, where they do the parades, and they have six houses, and they have the Commandant's house there. He lived in Quarters 4, and we've been on a long trip, have one night at home, and we're leaving again. And uh, and the routine was, I'd go to the house and go to the kitchen, that's where I'd meet him. And I remember, I'm tired, I swing the door open, and I'm looking around like, holy smokes, Mrs. Christmas sure changed the living room around a lot while we're going. I go in the kitchen, this lady screams and throws her coffee, I was in the wrong house. <laughs> so, but fortunately I knew her, but, uh, but uh, I went back scrambling. But Christmas is all set to go to Hawaii. It's his dream job. And they can't fill this manpower job at Headquarters Marine Corps. So at the time, I mean, we're getting ready to go, and I get into work, and he beat me into work. So I know that's a problem, something's going on. So I called, at the time, y'all may re remember recent chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colonel General Joe Dumfer, the Marine that was right before Millie. Well, he was the Commandant's aide at the time. So I, I call him and I said, hey, what's going on? He goes, they're all down here. Crew lack the new Commandant, Monday the outgoing, all of them. And uh, saying Christmas is down there. So I'm thinking something's cooking. So he comes walking back in, calls me in calmly, and said, hey, the needs of the Corps dictate that I stay here in Washington, D.C. Now, he might have went home and kicked his dog all night long, but he demonstrated to me at that moment, because this is, there's the prize, and, and it's gone. And the guy went back to work the next day and never missed a beat. And, and, and that was, he always preached needs of the poor, and, and that day I saw him at a monumental level really live what he preached. And uh, the interesting thing is, for years I thought he got forced to do it. And while we were doing the book, uh, I asked him about it. He said, you know, John, I did. He goes, I could have went to Hawaii. But he said, I really could tell, you know, what the service needed. And that moment, as bad as I wanted to go to Hawaii, I knew they really needed me to stay there. So he said, I prayed on it, talked to my wife about it, and I decided to stay there. Now, the intent was for him to come back and become the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps. A little vignette on that. When he was a regimental commander, 3rd Marines, one of the battalion commanders was General Chuck Krulak, who had become the commandant at that time. And the regimental commanders were required to rate his three battalion commanders, and who's the best, who's... And he said, Krulak and this other guy were just both excellent. Couldn't tell them apart, but he said, I, I rated Krulak two or three. And Krulak has a long lineage in the Marine Corps. Victor Root Krulak was a monumental character in World War II. And uh, he said at every step that that report went up, he got questioned about not rating Brute Krulak son number one, but he said, I never changed it. Years later, he sees this report when he's pulling his records before he retires, and someone had actually changed it to number one, but it wasn't him. But the joke was, Krulak said, he said, the moment he said, I'd stay with this group of generals, okay, I'll stay in D.C. He goes, never seen a more relieved group of generals in my life. He said, Krulak came up, put his arm around, and said, you'll be my ACMAC in a year, my assistant commandant. He goes, I never heard those words again. And he goes, maybe he was a little bitter about that fitness report, I don't know. But uh, General Christmas finished his time there. One of, the, one of the things he did when he got out, he ran a training program. And I don't know if you're all familiar with the National Museum of, of the Marine Corps in Monaco. And if, if you haven't taken it, it's not that far from here. It is an amazing campus, it's just something to see. And uh, he had a joke, he said, uh, never go to breakfast with retired generals, because they want something. Well, he got invited. And basically what they said, hey, hey Ron Christmas, uh, we have approval from Congress to build a national museum. 
We don't have any money. We don't have any land. We don't even know where to start. But will you take this on for us? And he did. And he uh, took it from that point, and he kind of upset the apple cart. He had a whole different approach to how he did fundraising and everything. But long story short, he took it from thought over breakfast at Quantico to, to what it is today. And then he stayed there as a director for a few years, and, and he finally retired because Mrs. Christmas will tell you if there's one thing that uh, her husband cannot do, it's uh, he cannot retire successfully. He always starts doing something else. In fact, uh, he retired on a Friday, and he was staying temporarily in the Quantico quarters for General Squad getting his house finished. And uh, I swung by to see him on a Tuesday, and I said, you know, is everything, all the plans we made, is everything working out okay? And Mrs. Christmas laughed, and she said, I thought Ron died yesterday. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, I have never seen that man stay in bed one second past 5.30. And he slept in. And she goes, I actually will go in and check one and make sure he's still breathing. Because <laughs> she's never in her whole life seen him, seen him do that. But uh, I asked him in wrapping up, I said, you know, sir, what, what do you think your greatest contribution to the nation was? And, and I would, you know, being a Marine, you think, well, I'll waste city. And that's not at all. And, and he said, when he was the... Uh, the J-3 of Pacific Command, I don't know if you all are familiar with Joint Task Force Full County. It came about, it's the organization that went back to Vietnam and started looking for remains. And, and this, it's such an interesting part of the book, not because I wrote it, but there was a Marine defector named Garwood that had served with, he supposedly got captured, but then he was actually siding with the Vietnamese. And he had came home and professed that there were several American POWs still held in Vietnam. And it, it you know, there are congressional inquiries, all kinds of stuff. Christmas was the, uh, the uh, J3, a guy named uh, Admiral Larson, who's an interesting guy, a pilot and a submariner, four-star general, was PACOM. And Joint Task Force were just coming about. They've been a miserable failure of a Joint Task Force down at your neck. So they're trying to, how do we really get it to work right? And Christmas came up with the idea, let's form a joint task force, let's go to Vietnam, let's go to Cambodia, let's go to Laos, and let's start excavating crashes, sites, and really see if there's any POWs there. And it's an amazing story, the year of negotiations that they had to go through with the Vietnamese. Yes, you can come here, but we have to dig, you have to use our help. It was just phenomenal, the, the, the extent that they had to plan this thing to do. And then the... They had a laboratory in Hawaii where they bring the remains back, but they find crash sites and everything from just pieces of cloth to a bone to anything, uh, they would get back and process. And, and he will tell you, and he, he told me, you can put this on the grave. If there's anything I did right, it was Joint Task Force Full County. So in his mind, that was his biggest contribution. And I, I remember he continued to participate uh, because the Clinton administration considered shutting it down. And he, he kind of went in and made the pitch when we would testify in Capitol Hill uh, about keeping that going. And it, it got to the point where it was so interesting to me where the lab would find a bone and they'd have an idea about who it was. And they would contact the family and they would seek to get the last letter he wrote home because he licked it. Yep. And there are cells on there. And they could match this, the letter to these bone fragments and stuff. It was, it was an extraordinary effort. And, and we did testify frequently on Capitol Hill. And, and uh, the one subcommittee where we always got beat up at the time, Senator Byrd was on it. Yeah. You know, see Senator Byrd. And then I, I did run into Senator uh, Rockefeller in the, in the passageway and said, hey, to him or whatever. But, uh, yeah. It was interesting going to Capitol Hill. We used to do a thing, and then I promise I will shut up. But we do this thing called walking the halls of Congress. And you literally would go on a day you had time, and of course all the armed services have liaisons there. So you come up and like, all right, who can we see today? Okay, you can see Shelby Foote. And all right, what do you need to talk to him about? Okay, talking about the Osprey, his grandfather was on Iwo Jima. They had a book on him, and literally you would go in and kind of Glad hand the guy a little bit, talked about the needs of the Marine Corps. And I remember I was up there with him and the Commandant one day, and the Commandant walked out, and he, he, they'd been in with Dan Coates and, and, and working him over a little bit. 
And uh, I remember General Monday came out and smiled and he looked at me and he goes, young man, that's the way armies and navies are raised in this country. He goes, don't tell the folks back home because they ain't nobody would understand. So, but uh, this book, like I said, it, it starts with his grandfather's arrival, kind of mystery, and then it takes you through now. Uh, General Christmas, believe it or not, I laugh, I tell him he looks better today than the day he retired. And that was in 1996. He's doing well, he lives down in North Carolina. He finally got his knees replaced because he was hesitant to get the surgery because he has very poor circulation in his lower leg and didn't go quite right, he wasn't going to have a leg. But uh, he's, he's as sharp and spry as he's ever been. And uh, talk to him frequently. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, but uh, I've rambled on enough, I believe. But hopefully it spiked your interest enough. Not for me, support the foundation. Yeah. And uh, if you'd like a terror bay if nothing else, you got a nice door stop or something to start the fire pit with. <laughs> but uh, I do appreciate being invited here. You yeah. have a great effort to see you represent the town. Great, great civil war. I live down in Spotsylvania, Virginia, down around all those battlefields, so it's certainly a big deal down there, too. So.